you, Barry, for reading that uh, powerful passage to us. We're going to be studying right there this morning, so go ahead and keep your Bibles open to Philippians, the second chapter. I want to thank Scott for that invigorating song service. It was wonderful to sing those great songs of praise and worship. And uh, in the singing of that uh, one song, um, Wonderful, Merciful Savior, it just reminded me that this coming week, uh, many of us are going to be up in Huntsville at uh, the annual exposure camp. And um, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, this congregation is uh, very intricately involved in exposure camp. As a matter of fact, we are uh, the overseeing congregation for this great youth event. Uh, and I would estimate that it's one of the, the best youth activities in the brotherhood. And uh, we are uh, proud to be involved in that. Of course, you know that uh, Daniel serves on the, um, on the board uh, for that. And um, we're excited up there next Saturday, or rather next Friday, we'll be there through Monday, and uh, we'll be singing a lot of these worship songs with, uh, it's going to be estimated right now at around 2,000. Um, in the last few years, this thing has been growing by about two to 300 people per year. And so just in the last uh, three or four years, it's almost doubled in size. And this year, they're expecting up close to 2,000 young people and chaperones. So it'll be a great activity, great times of worship and Bible study and Christian fellowship. And uh, I know many of you will be there with us, and we're really excited about that and looking forward to it. 1965, uh, George Stevens produced and directed uh, an epic American film that has been described as the retelling of the story of Jesus from his nativity to his resurrection. You maybe have seen this film. It's the film called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And I would submit to you this morning that the story of Jesus is really the greatest story ever told. But I also would submit to you that there is much more to this story than just from his birth through his resurrection. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't understand there's a lot to do with the story of Jesus before His birth. And there is a lot more to do with the story of Jesus after His, after his resurrection. And this morning, I want us to, to try to the best of our ability to see that, that full picture in what limited time we have and what limited uh, ability to understand in such a short time that, that we might have. You know, uh, the Bible tells us that there are so many other things about Jesus that, that we just don't know. John spoke of this as a matter of fact, in John 21 and verse 25, when he said that there are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, John said, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, that's a fascinating passage to me. It makes me think, you know, there's so much about Jesus we just don't know. And it also reminds me there's so much about Jesus that we do know that it's almost impossible to try to tell that story in just one city. But that's what we're going to try to do this morning. We're going to try to look at the life of our Lord uh, in three different stages. And I've mentioned this before to you, and I want to reiterate it uh, this morning for the purpose of our lesson. The purpose of biblical history is more than just to know history. It's to know His story. It's to know the story of Jesus. Uh, it is really to know the greatest story that has ever been told. And there is one passage that I want us to focus on, the one that was read just a moment ago, from Philippians, the second chapter. And, and in about seven verses here in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul really narrows down this greatest story that's ever been told. I mean, you think about all that could have been written about Jesus, all that we don't even know about Jesus, and all that we do know about Jesus. But Paul, he really narrows the focus in Philippians, the second chapter, to try to help us understand this story. And, and I think it can be done even in, in one lesson like we're going to be doing this morning. This is um, by far one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I'd like to preach from this passage a lot more. And if, if somebody said to me, you can only preach from one passage the rest of your life, I'd be tempted to stay right here in Philippians, the second chapter. One of my favorite Bible scholars said this about this particular passage. 
they said that these verses contain some of the profoundest Christological teaching in the Word of God. Now, that's Bible scholar code for you need to pay attention. This is something really rich about Jesus. And, and that's really what this is. This passage, Philippians chapter 2, is unique in that a child can read these verses and they can learn something. But you take the most mature, spiritual person here this morning, and there are many people that have read this passage over and over and over, and they still have not gathered everything that God says from this passage. That's how deep and profound this passage really is. But it contains three things that I want us to see in the next few minutes that remind us about the greatest story that is ever told. I said a moment ago, there's much about Jesus that happened before His birth. And so I want us to begin in looking at this story, the greatest story that's ever been told, by looking at something that happened before His birth. And we're going to begin with Jesus' heavenly state. It's described here, and we're going to begin in verse 5 because it's just a neat verse. It's a reminder for all of us that we need to be like Jesus. When it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You might paraphrase that verse by saying, have the same attitude that Jesus has. If all of us had the same attitude that Jesus has, then the world would be a better place. And then he says in verse 6, really getting deep into this subject, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. We're talking about the heavenly state of Jesus before he ever came to this world in, in this particular passage. Notice that uh, Paul uses the word here as Jesus being in the form of God. Now, um, those who study the, the Greek language tell us that the Greeks had two words that could be translated, as we would say, into English, in, into the word form. One of those Greek words was the word referring to mere external appearances. Uh, as you might see a, a mirage that takes the appearance of water. And so it's something that looks like one thing, but it's really not that thing. But then there's another word that they use which suggests the appearance is the true revelation of the object itself. Or it's the form participating in the reality. Guess which word is the word translated as form here in Philippians 2 and verse 6? It's that second word. In other words, when it says that, that Jesus was in the form of God, what this is saying to us is the appearance is the true revelation of the object itself. It, what it's saying is the form is participating in reality. In other words, what this is saying is God came down from heaven in Jesus. What it's saying is in heaven, God was, Jesus was, the reality of God. He was the form of God. He was, he was really God even in heaven, in His heavenly state. I think that just reminds us about the, the uniqueness of Jesus even before He came to this world. Notice it says here in this verse that He was equal to God. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God when He came down from heaven, but while He was in heaven, He was equal to God. That's hard for us to even contemplate. It's hard for us to even understand. Maybe to put it in human terms, Paul says while Jesus was in heaven, in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, that He was rich. That word rich there is not the kind of rich that means the richest person that lives in your subdivision. It's a word that means abundantly rich. It's what you know, we might call, in human terms, filthy rich. But that doesn't even really cover it. When you start talking about how rich heaven is. How rewarding heaven is. See, see, that's what Jesus had in His heavenly state. You know, a lot of people, they think about Jesus appearing on the scene for the very first time when they read about His birth. 
But I'm just reminding you that Jesus existed a long time before He came into this world. Jesus, even the Bible says, existed a long time before He came into this world. Technically, you read about Jesus in the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But, but really the first time specifically we see Jesus mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 1 and verse 26. Uh, and in that verse, uh, it, it just, we're just reminded that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice the plural pronouns there. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And again, scholars who study the original languages, they tell us that there's a Hebrew word here for God that is plural in nature. And, and this, is a, this is a highlight, really, of the concept or the doctrine of the Holy Trinity that we later will read about in the New Testament. The Trinity being the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so what you're really reading here in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis 1 and verse 26, you're reading about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit talking to each other, having a conversation with each other about the creation. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's what they were talking about when the world was being created. And you know what? Jesus was there. He was there in heaven when all of this was taking place. Uh, John reminds us that Jesus was there when the world was being created. As a matter of fact, Jesus, the Bible says, was the chief spokesman who willed this world into existence with His very words. That's how powerful He was in heaven. He could just speak and something amazing would happen. Like the creation of everything that is around us. John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. That's Jesus in heaven, just speaking this world into existence. If you notice on your outline, I want you to really appreciate what Jesus had when He was in heaven. In His heavenly state, I want you to understand that He was God. It reminds us here, He was equal with God. He was God. He was equal with God. And as I said just a moment ago, He was rich. That's what He had in this heavenly state. But yet, there is much more to this story, the greatest story that's ever told, than just the heavenly state of Jesus. Because you know the story takes a dramatic turn, and that's when we come to His humbled state. And we read about this humbled state, we really begin reading about it in verse 6, because it's, it's talking about how Jesus had the attitude, even when He was in heaven, that He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. It's telling us that He had the attitude that He was willing to give up something while He was in the heavenly state. And this is how that transpired. Verse 7 and 8. But He made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Some translations in verse 7 state that Jesus, instead of made himself of no reputation, that they state that he emptied himself. The ESV, the ASV, some other translations state that he emptied himself. Exactly what did Jesus give up to come into this humbled state? Well, you take all the things he had that we've already listed, and he gave those things up. He gave up his equality with God. He gave up the riches that he had there in heaven that I mentioned in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. And something else he gave up. He gave up his glory, at least an aspect of his glory. 
In John 17 and verse 5, in that beautiful prayer that Jesus prays in the garden that John tells us about in John 17, Jesus on that occasion said, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Many believe that Jesus is referring to something he's lost and that he's asking God to give him back. Some of the glory that certainly he emptied himself of. Now here's one of the reasons I love this passage so much. I love this passage because I don't understand it. Don't be afraid to not necessarily understand everything that's in the Bible. What what you need to know to please God and go to heaven, you can understand. And I'm convinced that even a young person can understand those things. But don't ever be afraid of a passage in the Bible that you can't completely understand. And I don't completely understand what this means. When, When it says that he emptied himself, I don't think I understand all that that means. Matter of fact, I'm convinced it means more than what I've already said this morning. I'm convinced that it means more than just him emptying himself of his equality with God, his riches, his glory. I think it's got to refer to even more. And I'm not sure what those things are. I have some opinions about those things. But let's just suffice to say that he gave up more than we can ever imagine. He gave up more than we can ever imagine. But there's one thing I want you to understand that he didn't give up. And you might want to write this down on the outline. I want you to understand that he gave up a lot of things, but the one thing that he didn't give up was his form of God. Remember, he was in the form of God. And he retained that form of God. He retained his deity, even though, as it says here, He took on the form, same word, he took on the form of a bondservant in the form of a man, coming in the likeness of a man. See, see, this explains one of the great mysteries of the doctrine of Jesus in the Bible. He was all God while he was on earth. He was all man while he was on earth. All at the same time. He was all God while He was on earth. He was all man while He was on earth. All at the same time. That's what you have. That's the the richness and the depth of this passage that's describing Jesus leaving the heavenly state and coming into the humbled state. Now, Now this is where most people think the story of Jesus begins. Right here is when He comes into His humbled state. Most people think of the story of Jesus beginning at His birth. But as you can see, the birth of Jesus was simply a a transition from the heavenly state to the humbled state. Now, nobody's disputing that the birth of a a baby is not a beautiful story. Oh, it is. We love birth stories. We're drawn to them. We're attracted to them because of the, the beauty and the innocence involved in such. The love that brought that baby into this world. It's a great story. But even in the Gospel accounts of Jesus' life, I'd like to remind you there, there's only a brief amount of text dedicated to His time as an infant here in this world. As a matter of fact, only Matthew and Luke give us the record of His birth. And Mark and John, in their Gospel accounts, they just skip it. And they just launch straight into the time when he's a man, when he's grown up from being a little boy. So certainly the the birth of Jesus is very significant. But I'd also remind you, nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to celebrate the birth of Jesus in a religious context above any other part of his normal life. There's a reason why the, the shepherds came, the wise men came. There's a reason. Because that's Jesus. We we don't downplay that part of the story at all. But but at the same time, we just remind people this time of the year or any time of the year that what the Bible says about Jesus applies more to when he became a man than when he was just a little boy. I've got a a friend who's a preacher and he told me that, that today his lesson... It's called Baby Jesus and Big Jesus. 
Think about that for just a moment. Everybody likes baby Jesus. But think about how much more the Bible says about big Jesus when he grows up. And one of the reasons people don't like big Jesus as much as they like baby Jesus is Jesus didn't talk when he was a baby, you know? We don't have a record of anything he said in those days. We just have the record of the story. But when Jesus got bigger, when he got older, and he started talking, he said some things that a lot of people didn't agree with. He did some things that a lot of people didn't agree with. He drew some lines in the sand, so to speak. And he said, I can't go beyond this. And my followers can't go beyond this. And if they do, is sin. Yeah, he talked about that. He talked about sin. Sin was so bad that he loved sinners. And sin was so bad that he died for sinners. So you can see why a lot of people don't like big Jesus and why they love baby Jesus. I'm just reminding you, though, he came into this world in a very humbled state, as a baby. But the Bible record quickly brings him to be a man. As a matter of fact, in, in our story this morning, in Paul's brief synopsis of this greatest story ever told, when he gets to the Lord's humble state of humanity, he launches straight into his form of a servant state. Doesn't say anything about him being a baby. He talks about him being a bond servant. He talks about him being a man. So was it humbling for Jesus to be a baby? You bet. Can you imagine? Being God in heaven, and then all of a sudden, you're thrust into this world as a little bitty helpless baby. Was it humbling for Jesus to be an adolescent? Sure it was. Was it humbling for Jesus to learn how to be a carpenter? and to work with his hands here on, in this world? Sure it was. Was it humbling for him to be a teacher that a lot of times people didn't like? Sometimes rejected by his, even his own people? Sure, it was humbling. Was it humbling for Jesus to have to suffer and even die? To die anyway? Would it have been, would it have been humbling for him to die in any fashion? Sure it was. But the most humble act of service that Jesus ever performed was becoming obedient to death. Not just any death, but the death of the cross. Here's something pretty deep for you to consider for just a moment. Only a divine being can accept death as obedience. That's what Jesus did. Only a divine being can accept death as obedience. Because for ordinary men, like the rest of us, it's a necessity. You're not going to choose if you're going to die or not. If this world keeps going on, none of us will choose if we're going to die. We're just going to die. It's going to happen one of these days. Unless the Lord comes back in our lifetime, we can't be obedient to death. That's a necessity. But Jesus chose to die. He became, it says, obedient to death. It was not something inflicted or forced on him. It was something he chose, as he said in John chapter 10 and verse 17. He freely laid down his life for the sheep. And ultimately, he humbled himself to become obedient to his father in death in order to show us how to become obedient to the father in life. You will never please God without becoming obedient to the Father, without following the example, the supreme example of what Jesus was willing to do, but to humble himself to become obedient to death. Gods don't die unless they choose to die. And God chose to come into this humble state and be a human and die. That's a part of this story that I think sometimes we we overlook the aspect of the humanity of God. God, as God, God as man, all coming together in that moment when he died upon the cross. So there is the heavenly state of Jesus. There's the humble state of Jesus. But you know, it goes beyond just the time when he was here, and, and it really goes back into heaven in what we would call the honored state. 
That's, that's really what we see in these last three verses, beginning in verse 9, going through verse 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some say that the cross is the end to the greatest story ever told. But they're wrong. Some say the resurrection is the end of the greatest story ever told. But they're wrong. It's not even the ascension that's the end. The story really hasn't ended yet. Because see, Jesus goes beyond that. He goes to this honored state up in heaven. And, and as far as the last place in Scripture we ever see Jesus, you know where it's at? You know where He's at right now? And it's the, the last thing we see. Other than the prophecy and the promise of Him one day coming again in the clouds, you know where the last place we find Jesus in Scripture is? It's in an honored state at God's right hand by His throne. That's the last place, place we see Jesus. Now would you consider that to be an honored place? Remember when James and John asked about positions of authority in the kingdom? Remember what Jesus said? That's not for me to give, but my Father. So when we last see Jesus by God's throne at His right hand, that is because God, the Father, has honored him and put him into that place. And so, I find it interesting then that while that is the reality, God really in Scripture honors Jesus in a different kind of way as this text tells us. This text reminds us that God finally honored Jesus by giving him a name which is above every name. And that's really what these last three verses focus upon. It's about this honor of a new name. What is it about this name that we should understand? Well, number one, it's a special name. There in verse 9, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. What name is that? Bible scholars believe that this is probably the name Lord. He's called in this passage, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now you know that in, in the first century that was a common name. Um, a slave might call their owner Lord. The Roman emperors eventually were called Lords. And even back in the Old Testament, um, the, the Hebrew translated uh, one of the names for God as Lord. It was the name Jehovah. But here's the catch. The people in the Old Testament weren't even supposed to utter that name. It wasn't even supposed to be on their lips. But yet, it says here in Philippians, the second chapter, that God has honored Jesus with a name that is above all names. It's as if God is now saying that Jesus is now master and owner of all. That He is the King of kings. And that He is the Lord for all people to be able to call upon. When the Jews couldn't call His name, Christians, those who want to be Christians, can call His name. You remember what it says there in Acts 22, 16? Why are you waiting? Arise, and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So it was a very special name. Secondly, it was a stainless name. It says in verse 10 that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every being in the world, in our world, in the heavenly world, should bow down and worship Jesus. Why is that the case? Why do we worship Jesus? It's because He's the only one that ever lived in this world without sinning. You choose to name your children names. And you know what? Eventually their name gets stained. Why? Because eventually they'll do something to disappoint you, to disappoint themselves, to disappoint humanity. 
Because none of us are perfect. I, I don't, you take the best person here, their name is stained because they're a sinner. There's only one person, there's only one name that's stainless. And that's Jesus Christ the Lord. And that is why all should bow and worship Him. And then the third thing about this name, most importantly for us this morning, it's a saving name. There in verse 11, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was exalted and honored the most in that His name has become synonymous with salvation. Acts 4 verse 12 says, Nor is there any other name, no other name named under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Part of the plan to reconcile sinners to God is not only believing in Jesus, but being able to call upon Him. To be able to, as I said a moment ago, to call on the name of the Lord. To confess His name. That you believe that He is the Lord, the Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If, if you confess with your mouth uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Part of the plan of salvation involves calling on the name of the Lord. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. About this time of the year, every year, we hear somebody say, wise men still seek Jesus. That's true. You know it's true. I would remind you the story of Jesus. His heavenly state, His humbled state, and His honored state. It's really the greatest story that's ever been told. Don't, don't just concentrate on one little part of it. Concentrate on the whole story and what it really means. That you'll appreciate Jesus a lot more if you'll concentrate on the whole story. Where He was, what He came here to do, and what He is doing right now. And that is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, waiting on you, if you haven't already done it, to call upon His name for salvation. New Testament reminds us the way that that is done in obedience to the gospel today is through belief, repentance, confession, and baptism. If you have not completed your salvation, your obedience to the Lord, in order to obtain salvation that He is willing to give to you, even right now, we want to give you that opportunity to do it. We want to give you the opportunity to come, confess the name of Jesus, and be baptized. Everything's prepared right now. You can become a New Testament Christian even this very morning. If you need to come back to God, if you've already been baptized but you've fallen away, we want to encourage you to come as well. Remember, Jesus is there. Last place we see Him, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, and he knows everybody here. And he wants to hear you call on his name for salvation. And you have that opportunity right now as we stand and as we sing.